We're in uh, Fanlin Falls, Ontario, with Don Payne, a veteran of uh, World War II. And I'd like to start by asking you, uh, how old are you, and, and how old were you when you enlisted? Well, I'm 93 now, and uh, I was 18 years old, <coughs> pardon me, when I enlisted, which was 1942. I heard all about it at the uh, Canadian National Exhibition. I was with my mother, and she said, you cheer up, Donald, you're only 15, you need to outwork a young. War will be all over by then. Yeah. Why did you enlist? Um, when I heard that, I thought, <clears throat> pardon me, but a good question, but uh, I basically would call it concern. Um, there was quite a, a, a amount of pressure from other fellows, like on the street where I lived, there were lots of guys, and these young fellows were joining up in the Navy or Army, my, <clears throat> my own brother joined up in the Air Force, and uh, so even though I had a job that I didn't have to go to war, I was working on ships in uh, Toronto shipyards for the British Navy. But uh, I still was compelled uh, through a friend of mine, so we both went down to, to the uh, exhibition grounds. They rejected him, they took me. Mm. <laughs> okay, now when you enlisted, I imagine there was some training. Where was that and what was that like? Well, the first portion is called basic training. And at that time, it had just opened a, a new camp at uh, Aurelia Camp. And so after, they were ha great habit for one week's holidays at the beginning. They didn't call them holidays, but leaves. And so I was to go to Aurelia Camp in one week. And the purpose of a basic camp is number one, to obey orders. So they made sure that they could put things before you that could make you angry, marching the way they wanted us to march, and basically getting in shape, long hikes. I can remember one uh, hike they took out of Varela was 25 miles long, full pack on your back, and you sweat your head off, that's how it was. When you were out there, they were teaching you terrain reading what you had to watch out for and identify when the day came that you were going to a tank. So you had to watch for these various things uh, that um, were important, such as the uh, position of the sun, the hills, uh, anything that stood out around you could be the pinnacle of a church in the distance. Uh, in other words, to take note of things around you so that you could relate to it in future, so you, so you knew where you were. Basically, map reading was what we were learning. And uh, as I say, I remember one time, one time they took us out in, to make sure that we could find our way back we went out in trucks with 15 boys and we got out as far as uh, we didn't know really where we were. They raised the flaps on the truck and I said, okay, find your way back. You were tell you, you're 15 miles from Maria. So uh, me having a mouth a little larger than it should be, we were just hiking back the way we knew it would be, but it was a long walk. To the tinkle of the sound behind me of a team of horses hauling logs. And those logs were, in my mind, whoa, what a great spot for riding into Rhea rather than that. So we timed it to get back, and we knew that we couldn't go back to the camp at A until then we knew the officer was back there. So we rode on this pile of logs and a team of horses. When we got near the village, near town, we got out, went to the favorite restaurant in the town, walked in there, and who's sitting there but the lieutenant? 
who took us out. Well, fellas, you're, you're back good and early. We'll meet in the guardhouse. So they, they put us to work uh, in there to, to teach us that way too. When you're given an order, you keep them. That was it. So after your training in Canada at Aurelia, you were shipped off to the UK. Where did you go and, and what was that like? You're a young man in a, a different country. What, the camp? Yes, I'm walking. Well, it was very nice because it was near a hospital and there were some very nice girls that used to come around and they needed help, comfort, to, to, to reach the uh, ca canteens, to take care of us and so on. Very friendly and kind. And the camaraderie was amazing. The people were so hungry that they would go to all ends to get it. As I said, my wife to be, she worked in the hospital. So the sick person said, oh, I can't eat any, any of the boiled egg. They would never throw it out. She said, we always put the egg in a basket or in our pocket. And then when we went up to the dues with the other fellows, about five other guys, and uh, we would uh, have a real good meal with what was available. Literally terrible lack of food in Britain at that time. So from there, we went out to um, train in the, what I call the hills. We just were in pop tents all the time and had to go through all types of weather. I believe it or not, woke up more than once with water right underneath the, the ground sheet that I was laying on. I really didn't think that much about it at, at that time. And so when, when you were in, what was your, your rank? And you had mentioned about tanks, so did you serve in a tank? Yes. What was that like? Well, I was with the color trooper, as I mentioned, I believe and uh, wireless operator and my responsibility was to uh, receive incoming calls and my job was to know the code because they could say it, something through it from the uh, from the main office we call it, the main area and they would say go to hill number so and so and I would pass that on because there were 15 tanks in the squadron and I happened to be in the lead tank with the officer and he gave me this code to pass over to them. That's what we did. And uh, you know, right in the center, I sat on the left side of the, of the top, the turret. And after that, to my right was the gunner. The gunner controlled all three. He controlled two Browning machine guns and also uh, a main weapon, which was a 17 pounder. One thing I had to remember that when I went under the, the back end of the gun, the main gun, we always had to duck, well, if he went around the back and he happened to be shooting, you know, he wouldn't be here to know what mm -hmm. hit you. So uh, you were terribly confined, terribly closed in. And I think they got me the most, the environment of only having a, a people of eight inches by two and a half inches, which swivel, you can see. Other than that, I sang my head off and nobody could hear me anyway, because of the way. But it must be uh, working so closely with these other men, the camaraderie, you must be very close. Very much, very much. We had to work together. Some one or two get a little bit belligerent. They would have to uh, uh, would have to work work it out. What number is that? Uh, that was number six. <clears throat> um, in England, I uh, I just mentioned this. In the eyes of of quite a few, I was considered one of these religious guys. And in England, you were really cool or you sat in bunk beds and I was with another Dutch guy from out west and they get a hold of the bunk bed, pick up the air and swing it around and say, okay, you are a prey boss. Honestly, when we were actually in action, 
from the other tanks, I'd get a call in and say, hey, Deacon, that's what they call it. Hey, Deacon, would you say a word for me? In other words, when they weren't under pressure, it didn't affect them. But when they were under pressure, they, they, they looked for help. So, yeah, you made a lot of friends. You met your, your future wife. And yet, uh, obviously, there's going to be some real sad. And what would you say would be the saddest time in the war for you? We had come to a, a place where we felt it was what, what they called a safe place for the night. Fifteen tanks, we set them up around a barn. Well, a large perimeter area. And in that night, most of the guys, when they weren't on duty, there was always one man on duty in the tank to, to warm, in every tank all night. Take your turns. But this particular night, uh, we had just gone into the barn and the fellows, there was about 50 of us from the tanks and from the infantry fellows. And they uh, were not sleeping on the floor. We do that all the time. We're going to get up with the hay bow. There, they scratch their way up into that to get there. But me being somewhat lazy, and along with a few other guys, why don't we sleep under that hay wagon? So we yanked down some stuff, spread it out under the hay wagon, and slept. About two o'clock in the morning, wham! Got a picture of it there. And the barn pretty well built apart. Many were killed. You're a young man away from home. What was it you would say sustained you? What kept you going during these difficult times? I would say it was hope. We had a very close family situation, and they wrote us letters. Plus, I had a gal in England that was also very much good, kind in writing, faithfully. By the way, mail was fabulous. They they knew that that was one of the most important points to get the letters across to these people. So basically, it was the family back home remembering us, the faith, of course. And number one of all was letters. And the other one I would say was uh, parcels. Parcels came quite often and they were filled with uh, very important issues like a pair of socks or uh, chocolate bars, uh, scarves, pictures, uh, never letters, that wasn't allowed. But you knew who it was from. When it came, it was everybody. There was five guys in the the parcel was open, and we all enjoyed it. You couldn't say just a minute, that came to me, you know. If the chocolate bars were there, they, they were spread around. <laughs> so, you are part of the liberation of the Netherlands. What would you say would be the, the greatest, the most memorable uh, or satisfying experience of the war for you? I think I, I would say, um, Believe it or not, carelessness. You had to be awake. You had to. You never knew what what a day held. So you just had to be on the bit. For illustration purposes, uh, we were going up a paved road, just near a river that was uh, a very main one, and the, uh, the piece of road, of course, was higher than the land around it. You know, but Holland is very flat. So what happened was that the, the Germans blew up the dikes on both sides and flooded the land right up. Tanks, artillery were okay as they moved up the, the road because of the fact they were higher than the, than the land. But that uh, just was an incident there. There were 15 tanks. We were heading up. I, we, I was in the lead tank with the officer who was to give the directions. And with that, uh, suddenly uh, he said, prepare, get, not, get your weapons ready. So I had in front of me where I sat the Browning machine gun. And we, we had been taught how to assemble it even in the dark. We had to. But as I was assembling it, I dropped a little piece of the trigger assembly, tickled down amongst the big shells. So I spoke on the line and said, Sir, we're going to have to pull out. He says, Why are you saying that? 
I was going to, I'm afraid I dropped a portion of the mechanism for the machine gun. So he uh, nicely swore up and down at me, so on. So we pulled out the lead tank and the others rolled on. Five minutes later, no more, wham! Artillery from the hills, or mounds, wherever they were, and we didn't see that. Hit the front lead tank, hit the rear tank, and flooded, so all 15 tanks were trapped. And our training was that if that ever happened, you became infantry, you know, we just got out, of, got out of it. But here we are sitting back trying to find this trigger assembly, and the guy who was swearing up and down at me, he turned to me and said, hey, Payne, thanks so much for being careless. <laughs> uh, many years have passed, you're, you're 93 now. I'm just wondering how often do you think about those times, um, and, and, and what, what do you think about your time at war, looking back now? Oh, I don't like to think about it really too much. Not that I'm being melodramatic about it, but uh, sometimes people ask about it, and that, that's, that's fine. And I think it should be kept to the forefront. But uh, there's always one major sad point, major. And that was a, a very close friend of mine named John Knight. The uh, picture there is of the cemetery. And uh, we, after the e in the evening before we closed down, as it were, for the night, uh, which had a lot of background we won't go into, but we were cleaning um, a ramrod, pushing it up down the main weapon of the tank, and uh, the guy says, let's stop for a smoke. And so the, the four of us stopped. I didn't smoke, that makes it hurt. And, uh, just set the thing at the pole aside, and the guy that was beside me, my closest friend at the time, his name is John Knight, and uh, him and I were standing here, and uh, we were just talking, and suddenly, and he was laying on the ground, just as quick as that. Uh, from a marksman, of course, went through John's neck, down to the floor, down to the ground, and uh, splintered. So the other two guys were both, had their legs badly injured. And we were not, I was the only one that wasn't hurt. And never forget that. And I said, oh, why, 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 why? <laughs> and you know, here I am, a, an older person, we'll say. <clears throat> uh, that still stands up very strong. So strong that my son, who works uh, in this kind of work for Canada, uh, so I wonder if any of the Knight family are still living. We traced them right to a farm out in the prairies. Father, mother, even his brothers and sisters had gone, but there was one, I think it was an aunt, who was left that understood and remembered the situation. And she just wrote me letters about it, you know. Mm. You know some? Mm. Wow, so you, you told us uh, some good experiences. I mean, you you met your wife. You have you just told me you have seventeen grandchildren now, uh, and and some obviously very sad experiences. But if you could go back in time, would you, if you were at the CNE, would you enlist again if you could do it all over? <clears throat> well, as I say, I, I didn't have to join up. I I had a good job, <coughs> making a big money at dollar an hour. You know, then. <laughs> and uh, the work was for the British government. <coughs> Pardon me. So uh, there I was uh, thinking about the whole situation. So if I was young and <coughs> pardon me, zealous, uh, still patriotic, yes. And I have to admit, at that time, I was very active as a a fisherman and uh, crew trips. I used to go out with other guys all through the you North know, Cobalt, right through the North Country. And they were very, very special to me. So we put that down for today. In my mind, that was it. I lose all that if the, as we call it, the enemy came and 
took over Canada. That was one angle of it. Much more that could be said. It's your turn. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would you would like to talk about? I think I'd speak about the nicest thing about the deliberation of Holland was the joy in the faces of the children and others. There are many areas they, they were actually starving. They were actually starving. And when you came down into a, a town or a village, they'd run along behind trying to get up to you, which was very, very dangerous because it's still, still going on war. But I can remember one time, there were about six or seven of them there, and I said, we, those guys are hungry. And I'm speaking of eight, 10, 12 year olds. So I got out my long john and, and uh, tied a knot at the end of them. And always in the tank, you carried uh, canned food, basically meat and vegetable, because the kitchen, as they called it, which was a truck. It opened on both sides, only came up once a, once a day. So the other time we had to eat from that stuff. Anyway, we put the canned foods into this pair of underwear, put it on top, threw it out of the tank, and they just went like hungry wolves after it, waving at us and so on. When you came into a town, the people <coughs> would, pardon me, would make, uh, bring out tulips and daffodils and decorate the tanks. And we wouldn't disappoint them, but just as soon as we left their environment, started out into the country again, all that had to come off because it made a dandy target. So that, was, that was how it was. <laughs> we have uh, approximately 2,000 students watching this today, Remembrance Day. What's your message to the, the students, the, the teenagers of today? The message of the, uh, is to have, in my mind, to have a sincerity of how much value we have in our country. No one today has to turn even a television set on to hear the problems that we have. Is it worth keeping what we have? Certainly it is. And the emphasis in my mind is that these children need to know, need to see that it pays to help, to help others. I remember one, one little point here how they we captured a doctor one time and they were going to send the doctor back to the holding camp, <coughs> pardon me, and uh, they said, no way, we'll keep the doctor with us. He happened to be very short, which was not very handy, five, five feet high. So he was handy to administer and help us. But uh, I use that as the illustration to show that the importance of helping each other. So I hope that these ch children realize that it's worthwhile standing up for what you believe in, whatever angle you wish to use there, do that. Well, thank you. On behalf of the students and staff at uh, Bayview Secondary School in Richmond Hill, we thank you for your time today and, and for, your, uh, for your service to your country. Thank you. Thank you. When was this photo taken? This photo was taken, uh, it's not dated, it'd be about 1995, when they, we were all invited over there for a special occasion for the Grenadier Guard Regiment. And we went around a cemetery called the Holton Cemetery. And two fellows that I knew very well there, the one I mentioned, John Knight, and the other one, our Padre. He was killed, believe it or not, four days before the end of the war. He had gone out to uh, help a German who was missing, and they th thought probably wounded, and he was killed. Went out in a jeep. This little picture here is us, you can't see other tanks, but we 
That's me sitting up on top of the gun. <coughs> Pardon me. And this is the barn that was hit in the night. <coughs> Sorry. And the reason why they got they were so successful, they had what they call a sticky bomb or magnetic bomb, really, which they could lob. And somehow or other, they got through the line there and, and blew that barn apart. I need not talk about how many were killed, but there were a lot. This picture here is very interesting. I got it in a Dutch paper. And the interesting to, part of it to me is that when evaluating it, it speaks about the tanks coming into a place called Almelo. And the enemy had blown up all the bridges. You couldn't get across anywhere. So we came across on the railway line over the bridge. And that's what's mentioned right there. And this happens, as I've told you, it was in the lead tank. This is the lead tank. And the reason I know it's our tank is because of the number. Can you see a number 52? It's there. And uh, this gives you an idea of how it was. This is not our tank, but this is exactly how it was. If you come into a town or village, they were so happy to see you that they'd climb up on top and just so excited. There are five of us in that picture, five fellas, little tasks trying to pick them out. The only difference from this tank from ours is the See this here on each side? That's part of the track, maybe a piece that had been blown out. And we had what called engineers that come up and would fix the tank at night if it had been damaged in any way, shape, or form, as long as it was movable. And I suppose this is the most momentous, uh, momentous time was when we were crossing the Rhine River and this may be difficult for you to, under, to accept, but it's true. Every 10 minutes, so all down the line, bang, bang, bang. They didn't do that one day. They did it three days. Three days, night and day. And so that was in a, a right up at that, at that time. So that's the front of them, and there's the fellows at the back throwing away the empties and piling up the other shells for it. Where did we sleep? Believe it or not, we didn't sleep, but we did dig a hole, get underneath the tank, and there was a, with digging a hole two foot deep, you, you had two foot clearance on top, you had a fair bit of room to stretch out for a rest. I was not a, a person that drank, a detoter, and the officer came around and he said, uh, I want all of you to take a shot of this, whatever, what I forget name. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't drink. He said, well, you're going to learn how to do it right now. That was it. <laughs> okay. That's fantastic. And the red ones were the ones we used at night. You can see them tracing, you see, across the sky, while the other was just a regular shell. Yeah, I'm getting your picture. <laughs> Beautiful show. You were on parade too, weren't you? I don't often see the DSA, right? Well, they're still around. Yes, that's right, isn't it? It's a great gathering, isn't it, today? Did you bring this lovely weather? Well, I didn't know I had it. It wasn't very nice this morning. Was it? So, it's, it's certainly very good downside. It really is. Once it's coming you, you this way. You brought it to us. It was lovely today and yesterday was muggy. Was it? Perhaps it'll last until tomorrow.